This presentation is part of the academic webinar series of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. To view a full catalog of our past and upcoming webinars, please visit www.nonviolent-conflict.org and click on the Learning and Resources button. My name is Jake Fitzpatrick, and I'm the Content Development Associate at ICNC. And today I'm joined by Dr. Joseph Bach, who is the Director of Global Health Training at the Eck Institute for Global Health at the University of Notre Dame, as well as author of The Technology of Nonviolence. And today's presentation is titled, What if Gandhi had a Smartphone? Uh, today's presentation will be about 30 to 40 minutes in length, and will be followed by 20 to 30 minutes of questions and answers. And once the presentation is finished, I will facilitate this question and answer portion. So now um, let me provide a brief introduction to our presenter um, as I switch over the screen controls. Joseph G. Bach directs global health training at the Eck Institute for Global Health at the University of Notre Dame. He researches and publishes on challenges relating to conflict and violence, focused especially on violence prevention. He has 12 years of international humanitarian experience, including overseeing global health projects in Pakistan, the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and served as a consultant to the Asia Foundation on conflict management and democratic governance, providing support in Thailand, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Bach has been asked to speak as a specialist on many topics, including violence prevention, foreign aid to Pakistan, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, ethnic violence and religious extremism, conflict, early warning and response, the refugee crisis and, in Africa, and more. He is also an editorial advisor to Development in Practice, a peer-reviewed journal founded by Oxfam Great Britain. He's the author of three, three books, of which the third, titled the Technology of Nonviolence, Social Media and Violence Prevention was published by MIT Press in 2012. His publications have appeared in several different countries in multiple peer-reviewed journals, including the Journal of Peace Research, Development in Practice, and Oxford University's Journal of Refugee Studies. Bach served as a member of the Working Group on Reconciliation of Car Caritas Internationalis, based in Vatican City. He received his Ph.D. in International Relations from the School of International Service of American University in Washington, D.C., and was a fellow with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and Executive Director of the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship at Haverford College and at the Secure World Foundation. He served six years in the Missouri House of Representatives with leadership positions as Chair of the Energy and Environment Committee and Vice Chair of the, of the Commerce Committee. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Joseph Bach. Well, thank you very much, Jake. I, I first want to start out and, and thank both you and Machi for um, working with me to put this webinar together. And I want to thank those of you in the audience for your interest in this topic. I'm really excited to be a part of this webinar series and uh, grateful for your interest in the subject matter of this webinar today. I'll go through the slides and then we'll be very interested to hear your questions and comments. I will try to go through them in a way that uh, will be understandable and uh, if there is something that I cover that's not, please remember it and we'll cover it when we get to the question and answer period. Okay. So the um, outline for today, we're going to start out with a little bit of theory. And then I have categorized the technologies that apply to nonviolence into three generations. We'll discuss a bit about the dynamism of technology as uh, it's used by oppressive governments or militant groups as compared to nonviolent movements. We'll uh, spend time on what the limitations are of technology. Uh, certainly it's not 
a panacea, and we need to be, you know, very specific about what it is that it can do and what it can't do. We need to be realistic about that. We'll talk a bit about uh, the technologies that oppressive governments and militant groups use, and um, I, I developed a section specifically on the impact of troublemakers, and I categorize those troublemakers and uh, refer to technologies that can be used in dealing with troublemakers, those who try to propagate violence during the course of a nonviolent transition. Um, finally, we'll talk a little bit about blackouts and ethical dilemmas, and uh, in the end, we'll get to the question, what would Gandhi do? Okay, I do want to clarify that my book is predominantly about violence prevention and ways to prevent violence uh, during the context of nonviolent transitions through mass movements is a part of it, but it certainly is not as um, focused on that subject as on the next slide, the book that, that Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stephen published. Uh, I believe that was in 2011. There is a citation for that here on this slide. I strongly recommend this book, Why Civil Resistance Works, and um, found it to be extremely enlightening. I did write a review of it, and uh, during the course of reading the book to write that review, it dawned on me that really what the two authors were arguing is what I would call loyalty shift theory, namely that there are pillars of support that each regime holds that allows the, the regime to stay in power and in you know, quite a number of instances allows it to provide um, unique benefits to only certain segments of society or allows it to be oppressive to its own people or both. And that those pillars of support, that could be the, the military, the police, the judiciary, et cetera, they are um, often able to continue to be aligned with an oppressive regime when they are feeling as if they are being besieged, uh, when they feel that the group trying to bring about a nonviolent transition uh, is a threat, then it's more likely that they will lash out uh, in violence and to maintain that, that violent posture over the long run. Um, and, and the point I'm trying to make here is that if you're trying to cause a loyalty shift of the pillars of power uh, that are supporting a government, it's very unfortunate if part of the people in the nonviolent movement are able to uh, propagate violence, because in doing that, the people within that pillar of support feel threatened and are much less likely to defect from the regime. So what I'm really focusing about on, on today as we go through this webinar is how to deal with the troublemakers who are out there who are likely to propagate violence and uh, therefore, in a sense, contaminate the purity of the nonviolent movement. We all know that it's going to happen, uh, that there will be instances of violence, but the issue is how to try to deal with those troublemakers so that the nonviolent movement can achieve a loyalty shift sooner rather than later. So now we'll go through the, the three generations of technologies that are, that are useful for nonviolent non-cooperation. And the first generation here is, is um, what a lot of people would think about when they, when they consider what the world was like um, in some respects even before we had telephones. Um, and actually it was uh, Machi in a conversation that we had earlier this week who, uh, of, the, of the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict who made the really interesting observation that, you know, for, for many years people used the printing press to 
to uh, share their ideas and to build a movement. And um, even before that, people would send messengers, and uh, you know they would be on foot, and they would uh, they would share their ideas and what was just and what was unjust to other people. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that people can get captured, uh, they can get tortured, uh, the, the print, printing material can be used to incriminate them, etc. cetera. Uh, also, sounds have been used. I know that a group in uh, working in Burma that operates out of Thailand called the Free Burma Rangers has used firecrackers to warn people that uh, the military was about to uh, fly over in helicopters. The firecrackers are used to get people to know that they need to hide under trees uh, and, and not reveal where they are because the helicopters would be calling in troops. Um, drums were used to similar effect in some places. And of course, there are signals. You know, people think of the smoke signals that uh, uh, are often in, you know, Western movies in the United States with Native Americans. Uh, those can go be seen over a long distance. Unfortunately, the weather can have an impact on those. Other people have used Morse code to to send information and to communicate. Moving on to the second generation, let's keep in mind that, that regular phones have been used for, you know, for decades. Um, of course, that allows for, um, you know, for communication that was not possible uh, with, the, with the first generation. It's interesting that in parts of Africa, I read a blog posting, I believe, of Patrick Meyer, who many of you probably know, and he talked about uh, how in places in Africa there would be one ring or two rings or three rings over the phone that people would use as signals that couldn't have been detected by the authorities. So uh, essentially there would be pre-designated messages uh, that were really based on the number of rings people would not pick up the phone, say, until after five rings, and if there were a shorter number of rings and that meant something, you know, whether that was, you know, we're going to have a protest event tomorrow or there is, a, a, you know, a death squad on the way or whatever. Those are ways that people have communicated with landlines um, in ways that really are less susceptible to surveillance. Transistor radios and uh, even more specifically uh, in smaller locations, community radio is a very effective way to disseminate lots of information to people who, uh, many of whom are, are uh, in some respects not even able to use uh, cell phones due to a lack of cell towers or the expense of the cell phones. And um, of course we can all remember the, the use of uh, transistor radios uh, during the genocide in Rwanda. Um, of course, there would be um, ways to use radios for the inverse. And in fact, if you think about the use of transistor radios, this gets into a whole other area of, uh, of ethics that we will talk about later on, but that is the role of outsiders. So it would, it would have been conceivable for people during the genocide to have used transistor radio towers outside of Rwanda to reach people in Rwanda to counteract the messages of hate and the propagation of violence uh, in Rwanda at the time of the genocide. So it's an interesting example, uh, transistor radio is of, of an important role that outsiders can play uh, with, with certainly some major ethical questions. Uh, Television, um, you know, television can be a great way to communicate, of course, with lots of people. Unfortunately, a lot of times, oppressive governments have control over those uh, stations. Um, it's interesting that in in uh, in some cases, some of the newer technologies, such as digital maps and uh, 
uh, using e e putting posting events data onto digital maps that we'll get to in the third generation, even when internet connectivity is low or when it has been disrupted by governments that if people can still get to television stations or radio stations, then it's possible to have announcers convey uh, essentially uh, very similar information and get the information out to the public. Of course, they do that at their own risk, uh, particularly uh, when they are in places where the government can go and the police or military can go and arrest them, torture them, et cetera. Cell phones are um, a huge advance, of course, uh, in the second generation. Um, what I have seen in, in my field research is that cell phones are by far the most valuable uh, form of communication, um, especially that people can, can use them and can communicate as they travel or when they get to a location, they can still be in touch with people. It's not necessarily just the fact that people can send text messages. It's not necessarily just the fact that they can they can take pictures and video and send them uh, to places. It's really the ability to communicate. Uh, I saw this in India, uh, in places where people would contact moderate leaders, uh, uh, leaders of all varieties, political, civic, and uh, including business leaders and religious leaders could be contacted to get them to bring their authority to bear to to stop the troublemakers in their tracks. And so the, the mere fact that cell phones are, are uh, able to be used in such a versatile way is a huge advance in and of itself in technology. Uh, of course, cell phone towers can be disrupted. Uh, there can be surveillance of uh, cell phone communication, and therefore uh, that is a disadvantage. Um, some of you have probably read in, uh, in the case of a violent revolution in, in uh, Syria now that uh, the cell phone towers and Internet access has been disrupted by the Syrian government, and some of, the, uh, some of those who have been using violence to bring about a revolution have, in fact, been uh, going to satellite phones. Unfortunately, satellite phones are also amenable to uh, surveillance. They're also very expensive, but it's an interesting example of what we'll talk about later, which is to say the kind of the dynamism of the technology where, you know, it's a little bit like water uh, trying to find a place to flow. If it, can't, if it gets stopped somewhere, it, it just dances on to another part of the landscape and finds a way to flow. So in a way, technology is exactly like that. Okay, going on to the third generation, uh, and I have two different slides for this because there are so many. Uh, we have, of course, text messages uh, and internet form submissions and email that can be used to uh, identify what events are happening where. And I really want to emphasize that it's so important in the course of a nonviolent transformation to stay on top of where there is trouble and for people to be prepared to, in a sense, isolate or to barricade uh, that trouble so that it can't spread and uh, discredit the nonviolent movement. So text messages, et cetera, are, are critically important in, uh, in providing events data uh, in situations like that. Microblogs, similarly, are useful. Um, with microblogs, you have the advantage that you can also send out information through platforms like Twitter um, by uh, using something that Patrick Meyer calls crowdfeeding and that allows people to get a message out to lots of people quickly. And uh, that's a huge advance. Um, a lot of you probably are familiar with the use of automation to generate events data, but there, is, uh, there are, are a number of software packages that will do that. Uh, to my knowledge, they're only in English right now. Uh, an example is the uh, Virtual Research Associates Reader. Uh, it is kind of an expensive technology, but 
it can be inexpensive if used over time to try to identify, um, let's say, that uh, there's been a government crackdown somewhere or that there has been uh, a plan on the part of a certain militant group to use violence in a certain location. Uh, those are the kinds of, of uh, news stories that can be parsed uh, with this kind of software that can, can generate events data. Um, it is possible potentially to, to uh, translate languages into English and then to use the BRA uh, reader to, uh, to develop events data. I just don't know how accurate that would be because you can kind of have a, a cascade of, of uh, misinterpretation that, e that evolves. Um, Pattern recognition is another uh, technology that involves mathematical approaches. Uh, some would say that that's a methodology rather than a technology, but I don't want to split hairs here. Uh, that is a major advance to, uh, in some respects, help people identify uh, trouble spots in a, in, a, uh, in a different geographical location than people might be expecting it. In other words, sometimes there are uh, deficiencies in collective assessment of risk or of uh, getting a sense that there is a location where there will be trouble. Uh, sometimes mathematics can be useful in identifying those places when collective assessment would be flawed. Okay, uh, third generation continued. Uh, many of you are familiar with Ushahidi and the use of digital mapping, uh, GIS data, uh, geographical information system data is extremely uh, useful when you're doing digital mapping because it helps you pinpoint the location. Uh, this is, you know, this is the kind of technology that uh, if you if you've watched any of the old, uh, say, World War II movies where you know, the military uh, generals and admirals are standing around the table and moving around ships and tanks and troops on a table. They're developing strategy. That's what they're doing at those tables. Well, in a nonviolent transformation, digital mapping and geographical information can be used for, in a very similar way in people in different locations, whether in the same country or all over the world can get a handle on what's happening, what assets are where, what events are happening where, and that can be depicted on a digital map. And that's, that's a huge advance of technology in, in uh, what Ushahidi and other similar platforms provide. Something that a lot of you have probably not thought of is the use of virtual reality to the extent that nonviolent movements need to train people of what to do in various scenarios. Virtual reality uh, play, uh, websites like Second Life can be used to train people about what to do. If you've seen the movie The Interrupters, that's uh, the, the Interrupters are former gang members who prevent violence, uh, try to prevent violence between gangs in, uh, that are about ready to start becoming violent in Chicago and elsewhere, they developed a Second Life site to train people, to train interrupters of how to do, um, you know, intervention so that uh, the gangs do not become violent or that uh, people do not use violence. Well, that type of platform uh, can certainly be used in nonviolent transformation so that those movements can have economies of scale and can scale up in the number of people who are being trained in how to maintain discipline, etc., during a nonviolent transformation. Um, I hesitated a little bit to add the uh, unmanned aerial vehicles in, in satellite imaging because I, I don't know to what extent those have been used yet with nonviolent movements. But, you know, they do provide information that can be useful. I, I know, and some of you probably know more about this, but I know that in Darfur, the Janjaweed movements were monitored using satellite imaging. And there has been some, uh, some literature 
talking about in the future nanotechnology uh, and then aerial vehicles could be used to assess compliance of certain treaties um, or of certain agreements that, that certain groups will no longer be attacked. Um, and that if you use those, then the international community will not have to expend their diplomatic capital um, to, uh, to send delegations into those locations. Uh, instead, it can be done through these vehicles. Okay, so going to the next slide here, I, I, I did want to just kind of explain that, you know, it's, it's a dynamic, uh, multi-dimensional dance, if you will, of what, what technologies will be used when. It has everything to do with what's available and what can be adapted. And uh, we need to keep in mind, however, that it's a double-edged sword that really, um, you know, militant groups and oppressive governments can use these technologies as well. Um, I would say that um, what else is needed, we need to keep in mind that, you know, very little, if I could just, if you could just see here on the bottom of the slide, the 90-10 uh, the rule that uh, a man named Chris Blow developed that has been blocked about on various Bush heating blocks is basically that you need, you know, maybe 10% at the most is technology, 90% is the rest of it. So, so I would say that the 90% is predominantly the big three. You need people who are, who are trained, who are trusted, you know, in some places that's called the trust network. Uh, you need to have strategy, and I know in places like Egypt and elsewhere they were bringing people in who had done nonviolent uh, transformation in other countries, I believe Bosnia was one, uh, who understood the strategy um, to help the Egyptians develop theirs, and you need to maintain discipline. And uh, the technologies can be useful really for all three of these, but it's only a small part of it. It's the, it's the, the people, uh, the commitment, the strategy that they have that really makes nonviolent transformation possible. I would also say that international supporters can also be instrumental, particularly diplomats who use their leverage, and that in some respects there does need to be a rule of law. Now, what kind of rule of law is the subject of this next, this next slide? I've given lots of talks about uh, the use of, of uh, nonviolence in transformation. And uh, many people think of Mahatma Gandhi, but many people don't know about Abdul Zakir Khan and the Nonviolent Servants of God. Uh, they were active in British India. Uh, he, uh, Abdul Zakir Khan was a close friend of Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, he was traveling, apparently, with Gandhi during the post-partition riots when uh, East and West Pakistan were being partitioned away from uh, India. And uh, Zafar Khan's brother was instrumental in uh, getting the nonviolent servants of God. There were 10,000 of them, roughly, who participated in, in a nonviolent protection uh, action uh, to prevent Muslims from attacking Hindus and Sikhs in the northwest frontier province in the area of Peshawar. And this is a uh, not so much a law in the Western sense, but a law in uh, Pashtun Wali, the code of ethics of the Pashtun speaking people uh, in that part of uh, former British India. Uh, I like to tell people that, uh, as far as I know, the first nonviolent army was Muslim, and it was developed by Abdul Zafar Khan, and that they uh, were successful in preventing this violence. I just want to direct you to this case study that uh, Robert Johansson wrote. You'll have the citation on the website. Uh, but again, there were 10,000 Muslims who defended vulnerable Sikhs and Hindus in the Peshawar region, and they were successful in getting in the way, as the people of Christian peacemaker teams would call it, and Muslim peacekeeper te peacekeeper peacekeeping teams. Um, so, 
Okay, so oppressive governments and militant groups also can use these technologies. Well, um, in some respects, that isn't a, I don't think that's really a good reason why people promoting nonviolence and using nonviolence to bring about transformation, why they shouldn't use them. In a way, if they're using them, then that's all the more reason that we need to use them. Um, there, there have been uh, some conversations that I've seen over the internet uh, through blogs that, in fact, um, typically governments are relatively uh, clumsy in using new technologies, in part because of their bureaucratic ineptness and in part because of the, the secrecy of some of the the organizations, and therefore, at least with governments, typically nonviolent movements can keep one step ahead. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, because nonviolent movements are nonviolent, typically lots of people will participate. Um, those who don't want to use violence will not participate in a violent revolution, typically. Those who don't want to use violence and, and really were kind of reluctant to even be involved in, in a uh, political transformation will um, probably eventually feel free to participate. And uh, because of that, uh, in a way, the technology can even be more effective because people, you know, if everybody can participate, more people can use it and the dance of the dynamism of technology can work to greater effect. Now here is what I've done in terms of uh, dissecting the type of trouble and then useful technologies that can be brought to bear to deal with that trouble. And again, I'm just talking about you know, the troublemakers who are, who are either planning uh, to deliberately uh, sabotage a nonviolent movement or um, who are spontaneously kind of losing their tempers and contaminating a nonviolent movement, or who are bluffing the fact that there's been violence, or uh, there's also a possibility of almost predicting trouble when uh, something is going to happen. And, you know, there are certainly, um, you know, there are certain times and places, uh, oftentimes religious festivals, where trouble is predictable, and certain locations of that trouble is predictable. So uh, in each of those, it's important to think through the technologies and the strategies that can be used in, in uh, each type of trouble. So I think it's really important to keep in mind that identifying hot spots is a huge advantage that crowdsourcing and digital mapping uh, helps us. And then having a trust network, a group of people who can intervene uh, when we identify where trouble will be uh, or to verify that trouble. Uh, all of those technologies, uh, I would say, are, are a huge advance in keeping a, a lid on trouble that is either planned, spontaneous, bluffed, or predictable. So um, that's an area that I think would be a fruitful place for us to think about tactics, technologies, uh, as, as uh, we go forward. Okay, well, what about blackouts? Well, I think, you know, when, when people stop, you know, they, they, they discontinue the use of, uh, you know, they, they sabotage cell towers or they uh, they stop internet service or they jam Twitter or whatever it is that they do, I think that what we see is that people step back. So, okay, they no longer have internet, they no longer have cell phones, they start using radios, whether that's ham radios or transistor radios. Uh, that, that would be an example of stepping back a generation of technology but still being able to communicate. Uh, or, uh, as I talked about with Syria, even though it's a violent uh, revolution, um, you know, they, they moved into cell phones, and sadly they're finding that those cell phones are, are um, subject to um, surveillance and the people using them are being uh, assassinated. Uh, uh, but it is an example of moving forward and using a, uh, 
a more advanced technology when an, another technology uh, or is not uh, available. Um, and as I said with Rwanda, you know, uh, let's just say that in Egypt there is a, um, a discontinuance of any kind of technology for communication with cell phones or the internet. Um, it could have been possible for people on the outside uh, to use uh, very powerful radio stations to be able to communicate over transistor radios. So that's you know that's another possibility of just pivoting over to outsiders. Um, okay, the ethical dilemmas. Uh, I'll just drop to the the bottom bullet here. Uh, you know the influence of outsiders is is very problematic in that. You know, people all over the world can now, through social media and other forms of communication, they can influence the uh, what's happening on the ground. And I think that there there needs to to be an ethical principle that that those who are at risk, those who have their lives on the line, need to be the ones making decisions and developing strategies. You know, those outside can certainly support them in taking those risks and uh, developing those strategies uh, by, by, you know, kind of helping them with their capacity, but it's really problematic for people on the outside to have an impact on decisions and strategy when they don't really have the contextual knowledge of what's happening. And they're not the ones who will be shot if they make the, the wrong move, uh, shot or tortured. Um, in terms of, of uh, non-transparency, I'm sorry, if we, if we go back to that top bullet, you know, it's a, it's a dilemma, it's a conundrum that a lot of organizations have that you might have a completely transparent process of crowdsourcing, for instance, everybody with a cell phone can send in a text message to a central location uh, in a collective effort to digitally map hotspots, um, but you may not want to send a warning that there's going to be trouble in a certain location to that crowd. So it's transparent in a way when you're crowdsourcing, but it really shouldn't be when you're crowd feeding because that's like yelling fire in a theater. And this is something that people struggle with, and I don't think that there are any easier, easy answers to it, but it, it's certainly an ethical dilemma. So these are the areas that we've covered, but we haven't covered what Gandhi would do. So here uh, on the next slide is my, um, how can I say it, my version of what I think he would do if he had these technologies in his hands back at the time of the of the nonviolent transformation of India. I think he would have used his, uh, his nonviolent strategy. Uh, he would have taught people the techniques and the, uh, the states of discipline uh, that he used, and he would probably use virtual reality to do that. He probably would have a, a, uh, uh, a second life island. Um, he would make calls to the other. He would make calls to Jinnah, you know, the, the Muslim who was instrumental in the breaking off of East and West Pakistan. He would call Jinnah and talk with him with his cell phone or his smartphone. And he wouldn't ignore him. He would engage with him. He would use speed dial to contact uh, influential people within a trust network during times of acute tension. He would communicate with Twitter. He would uh, have a secure way of communicating uh, to his trust network, uh, including with identifying where trouble was likely to erupt. Uh, he would use his camera uh, on his cell phone to uh, send not just uh, the sad information of human rights abuses, but also uh, instances of when there was ethno-religious harmony, and he would probably use Twitter to, to send out those uh, pictures and video, and, as well as to use it to calm people and to counteract false rhetoric, what, what my friends uh, 
in uh, Ahmedabad, India called Myth Busting. Um, he would use YouTube to inspire people, although we all know uh, we should remember that there is not a requirement to have charismatic people in a nonviolent movement for it to be successful. Well, certainly if you have one, you know, get them on YouTube. Um, he would also stay in touch with people of all faiths to disallow the youth of whether it's Hindu nationalism or Islamic nationalism or Christian nationalism or whatever that might be, to disallow uh, religion to be instrumental in the politics of division. Uh, finally, I do think that Gandhi would have had a Blackberry, and maybe I'm partial to Blackberries because I have one, but I think he would want their more secure platform. I know that's debatable, but he would also have his GIS feature turned on. That's, uh, that's all I have today for our presentation, and uh, I want to thank the people again of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. I also want to thank people uh, in India, Father Cedric Prakash, uh, in Pushpa Ayer, and I want to thank the people at the Foundation for Coexistence, the workers there who were so instrumental in teaching me what I've learned. Happy to answer any questions at this point. Great. Uh, thank you, Joseph, uh, for your presentation. It's very much appreciated. Um, as a reminder, uh, there's two ways if you want to ask a question. Um, go ahead. You can rate, hit the raise hand button, um, and I will be able to see that, and I can unmute you, and you can ask your question that way, or I'll keep an eye out on the questions pane. Just uh, You can type it right into that side panel that you see right there, and that will also pop right up. So let me give you a few seconds just to get those ready. Um, I wanted to ask one question for you, Joseph, that kind of relates back to uh, your book, The Technology of Nonviolence. Um, I, one of the things that I saw that you covered in that book is this, this idea of and this, these efforts that are enhanced by technology for stopping violence before it happens. And you actually listed off a couple different ways you said uh, planned, spontaneous, bluffed, and predictable um, types of troublemakers. And as you point out, it's very important in, in peacemaking, but it's also important for the success of nonviolent campaigns. Um, you kind of covered briefly the negative effects that this violent flank can have on the goals of a movement, on the perceptions of a movement, on whether people still want to join the movement. So I, I guess based on the experience you've had, have you seen any instances of this sort of internal policing uh, by movements to to keep to try and keep their actions peaceful? Well, you know, I I um, I've seen where people intervene to um, to prevent. I mean, basically, uh, to prevent a bad situation from blowing up into violence uh, in Sri Lanka. There was a Scandinavian group that had, uh, under the ceasefire agreement, that had authority for monitoring. It's called the Sri Lanka Monitoring Mission, and uh, they would, you know, frankly, often exceed their mandate of monitoring, and they would actually go in and intervene if they heard that there was violence about ready to happen. Uh, they would go in with their little Toyota pickup trucks with a big flag, S L M M in English, and I think they had something in uh, Tamil written on it as well, and maybe uh, Sinhalese. But, you know, they would go in and they would intervene uh, quickly to uh, to try to, sometimes just having a presence there would um, prevent the violence from happening. Sometimes they would get involved in negotiations. Uh, certainly there were times when people from the Foundation for Coexistence would do the same, or from some other uh, international or national non-governmental organization, or some community-based organization, uh, elders, uh, groups of religious leaders. One of the challenges uh, to this, however, is the amount of time that's available, and that's something that I really tried to analyze and, and report in my book, is the length of time between what uh, Donald Horowitz, uh, in his book, The Deadly Ethnic Riot, 
called the time between a precipitating event and the onset of violence. He called that the lull, the amount of time. And the empirical analysis that I did on the events data provided from Foundation for Coexistence on uh, the amount of time between a precipitating event and the onset of violence, the amount of time was, was uh, with, uh, almost always within two days. And so it isn't like you can typically call in outsiders. Uh, rarely could you bring in uh, a big uh, group of peacemakers from a capital city uh, such as Colombo to the eastern province of Sri Lanka, which is where there was this break off uh, renegade group uh, called the Karuna, uh, after the Colonel Karuna rebelled. Um, away from the Tamil Tigers, uh, the Muslim and, and uh, Christian Tamils predominantly in the East br tried to break off from the Tamil Tigers, so it became a rather violent uh, province. And, and so it was, it was in that context where the amount of time between a precipitating event and the onset of violence was all overwhelmingly within a two-day period. Thank you. Um, this next question is, is a combination from two different people, from Tom and Abraham. Um, Tom's comment is he, he found it very interesting that you elaborated on low, low technology having an impact. I guess that was the, I forget, I forget if it was the first or second generation that you mentioned, um, the example of Rwanda and, and how radio could have been used to combat hate speech um, he thought was, was very interesting. But to elaborate on that, um, Abraham's asking how, how can these campaigns, what, what, what elements do these campaigns need um, when you're having someone from outside of a country uh, that's especially repressive, a place like North Korea, or he mentions uh, Eritrea, where nonviolent organizing is illegal. Um, what, what can the role of you know, telephone, radio, or televisions be in a country like these kind of places? Well, I, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, certainly we all know kind of underground uh, radio stations, underground newspapers uh, that have existed during different nonviolent uh, movements. I, th I think my example of, of Rwanda was really, um, you know, the idea that, you know, you could have outsiders who could still communicate over transistor radio um, I think that, you know, there would be lots of ways that outsiders could still be involved. Let's say that it's extremely oppressive and the government has no control over the radio waves. So, okay, so you're in North Korea, you could have a radio station in South Korea that, um, you know, here, they, they somehow can be informed. Let's say, okay, let's think of an old technology, doves, the messages from North Korea are sent to South Korea with doves with messages on their on their legs with a rubber band, and then the radio station says, uh, "We've heard word that there's been a crackdown in Blank City in North Korea, and uh, all people throughout Korea could hear that, or that there was a nonviolent protest in this other city of Korea, and uh, you know, these people were beat up, but nobody was killed, and." And then everybody dispersed, and the government had a hard time keeping track of who showed up. You know, those are the kinds of things that sometimes outsiders can do, provided that the insiders in South, uh, I'm sorry, in North Korea, uh, are involved in developing that strategy and realizing that they're the ones who are taking the risk. Then that's a huge role that outsiders can play. I, I, just in a, as an in a, a aside, the reason I bring up the, the Rwanda example, I was in Catholic Relief Services headquarters when the genocide started, and there were a group of us there who were literally talking about where we could buy a radio station to counteract hate, hate speech, what, what country, what station, what would it cost, and, you know, uh, this is a, a bit of a, of a, I guess maybe a, a push from my perspective that a lot of times the international non-governmental organizations spend so much time chasing U.S. Agency for International Development money that they, they stop thinking 
of innovative things that they can do, that they can do with their own private money rapidly, that would have a huge impact. And I really think that more time needs to be spent thinking about that and doing it. Another question from Nicholas. Dr. Bach, how do you see people using new technologies to help prevent violence while the same technologies are allowing government or violent forces to figure out who those people using the technologies are? Um, this could potentially put their lives at risk and their families at risk. So do people consider this enough before tweeting, texting, or using other kinds of social media platforms? Um. You know, I, I suspect that, you know, that they, they probably don't think about it enough, and in a way a nonviolent movement can communicate that, you know, since they can, they can forewarn people, uh, kind of inoculate them from being careless with their communications. Um, you know, that's why training is so important. You know, if you train people before things get really tense, then you have a trust network on the ground who can communicate. And, you know, they can put up flyers, don't use Twitter to communicate about this or whatever. Uh, even if they aren't going to use Twitter to communicate their message, uh, they're using paper, they're using a printing press to, uh, or a copy machine to communicate. I, I think that it is a, it's a very challenging question, uh, if, you know, if you use social media that's not encrypted, uh, it can be used to identify who the government is going to torture next. So I think people do need to be careful. Uh, I think, you know, people do learn quickly that they've got to be careful. I saw in, in Sri Lanka the uh, field workers of um, the Foundation for Coexistence, they learned that they had to delete the records of their text messages before they went through text, uh, checkpoints. When they were leaving the eastern province and they were going to other parts of Sri Lanka or even in the eastern province, whenever they saw a checkpoint, they would pull by the side of the road and they would delete their messages because they knew that some of those messages could be used to incriminate them. So I think it's a problem and I think it's the kind of thing that needs to be you know, kind of figured out in a in the sequential tactics of an overall nonviolent uh, strategy that people are going to use. That that they they really need to uh, forewarn people and give them some guidance as to what kinds of communications to use and what not to use. And you know, uh, there might be places where they can encrypt and places where they can't. Thank you. Um, this next question comes from Dean, who's a Occupy Oregon media group, part of the Occupy Oregon media group. And uh, just as a side comment, speaking of social media, I, I really liked your your proposal of, of Gandhi use, using Twitter and tweeting to his followers. I would definitely love to see a hashtag for the for the salt march and then a, a YouTube video of him making salt at the sea. But um, that's just a side note. So uh, Dean asks. As a journalist and a media coordinator for a statewide Occupy group, what special approaches and technologies need to be employed to get your version of the story out accurately and to counter misrepresentations portrayed by others? Well, first of all, I, I like the image of the, of the uh, protest against the salt law. It's, a, it's an interesting one. Um, I think that really you know, one of the biggest things is that, you know, people are are going to propagate uh, misinformation. They're going to, they're going to try, try to create trouble with uh, social media uh, and, and uh, just as much as people are going to try to use it to, uh, to try to keep a lid on troublemakers. I, I think that, you know, really, I can't stress enough the importance of training people and having a, 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 a trust network uh, sent around the whole, you know, the whole state in, in this case to understand what's going on and to be able to go out and uh, either verify or discredit rumors. I mean, uh, the people at St. Xavier Social Services Society, I covered them in my book, uh, they, they called this myth-busting. And they had trust networks. They had civil society groups 
um, who were uh, essentially, it would be, I mean, think of Rotary. Every Rotary has a chapter all over the state. Well, you, you could have something like Rotary in every part of the state, and those people would be trained in nonviolent techniques, but they would also be, be people that you can trust to go out and either verify or discredit information as soon as it's propagated. Because there certainly is, you know, um, as I indicated with the troublemakers, there certainly is contrived, uh, invented uh, trouble that, that happens. People come out with statements just like what it's been happening in India uh, where there's this idea that uh, a certain uh, ethnic group was going to be attacked by Muslims. And it's just one militant Muslim group that's putting horrible pictures over the Internet. Well, um, what has to happen is that that has to be discredited. So what do you do? Well, um, you come out with another Internet site that discredits them. You have uh, uh, YouTube feeds of reporters on the ground from your trust network saying, okay, you know, the militants have just put this up on their blog or on their internet site, uh, and we're standing right there uh, in, in the place where they say it's happening, and here's a picture of everybody, you know, sailing around in their sailing boats. You know, nobody's massacring people here. Uh, it looks peaceful to us. So you basically, you know, it's kind of a tit-for-tat thing. You've really got to be out there quickly. Uh, you've got to be uh, aggressive about it, and you've got to use social media to uh, your advantage, uh, just like they're using social media to drum up trouble. I think this idea of, of training is worth focusing on for just another minute or two. Um, I know we're running a bit short on time, so if anyone else has any final questions they'd like to ask, uh, please get those ready. But in the meantime, um, what 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 are some of the role? I know you mentioned uh, this idea of virtual reality as a way to to train um, people in a in a movement. Um, but what are what are some other methods that you think any of any of these generations of technology you've mentioned have either already been used successfully for training and mobilization purposes, or you think could be used more successfully within movements? for training specifically? Well, I think that, um, I, I think that uh, certainly, you know, developing the capacity to maintain discipline during a nonviolent transformation is, is, I think, very challenging. And you need people, you know, in, in the, uh, the Catholic tradition, we talk about formation. A lot of people uh, in the religious communities talk about uh, a formation. Well, it's the formation of the human being as a spiritual being and as a psychological being, etc. Well, all of that is, um, I mean, in a way, a nonviolent movement needs formation to be able to maintain discipline. And there are certain kinds of training that can help people. What's it going to feel like? I and mean, what, what are the young people in Egypt feel like when they knew at the beginning of the day they were going out there and they were cutting up uh, Coke plastic bottles to put under their clothes as body armor because they knew they were going to get beaten that day. I mean, that's discipline that they still went out in those in those crowds knowing that they were going to get beaten. You know, they had rags with with vinegar that they and, and lemon that they would put over their faces when they were getting tear gas. Okay, so you can train people. How do you make body armor? How do you how do you uh, put vinegar and lemon juice onto a rag when you get gassed? Uh, but you can also teach them how, how do you not hate, how do you not blow up when somebody starts beating you? I mean, how do you, how do you not become violent? How do, you, do you just curl up in a ball? I mean, what do you do? So there are techniques that can be taught. I also think that, uh, you know, some of the technologies, uh, particularly the collection and analysis of events data, whether it's on a digital map, or um, in an events database and something like Excel where you're, you start using uh, something like moving average, uh, convergence, divergence, uh, real basic pattern recognition. What you want to do is you want to identify when trouble is about to happen and where it's about to happen. And then you want people from your trust network to go there and prevent it from happening. Well, what are the signals? What are the signs that's going to happen? Um, I believe that 
uh, there, you know, sometimes the indication is a rumor. Uh, sometimes uh, an example that I saw in Lebanon last summer, there's a group there called the Permanent Peace Movement, uh, and they and Catholic Relief Services did a lot of focus group interviewing. If there's going to be violence in a neighborhood, one of the first signs is that the children of different groups stop playing with each other because the mothers are aware that there's going to be trouble pretty soon and they want to keep their kids away from either, uh, you know, any of the groups that they think will be in conflict with their group. Well, what a great uh, sign. So people in those neighborhoods who have been trained, they could see, okay, that isn't like some newspaper reporter putting that in the paper. That's something that a, someone in the trust networks walks by a playground and they don't see the little kids playing soccer anymore of the different groups. In fact, the playground's empty. What does that mean? Well, it could mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be violence. It's part of an overall picture that is identified using events data. You can use inductive reasoning, you can use mathematical pattern recognition, but basically you're identifying where violence is likely so that you can intervene to prevent it from happening before it happens. Those are just two examples. Thanks. Those are, those are really great examples. Um, I think we have one more question, and it'll probably be the last one. Um, th this is kind of a heavy question for the last one, but um, maybe you can answer it briefly, Joseph. Uh, what, what are some? Do you see any optimistic possibility for nonviolent struggle in China? Um, to narrow that down a bit, I guess. Have you been following sort of what's been going on with China, and, and have you seen any use, whether whether good or bad, of, of technology, in in terms of nonviolent struggle, civil resistance within China? Uh, that's a that's a great question. You know, I, when I was with the Secure World Foundation, there was a a meeting in Washington D.C. of uh, foundations that were funding non-governmental organizations or that had Headquarters in China, and and we were we were supporting a uh, a U.S. non-governmental organization that had an office in Beijing. So we were at that meeting, and I was dumbfounded to hear, and this was probably I don't know seven eight years ago. I was dumbfounded to hear at that time that there were roughly seven hundred thousand instances of protest in China a year at that time and that the predominant way that people were uh, forming um, protests was like this instantaneous meet us at the corner of Blank Street and Blank Street, we're going to protest whatever, okay? And that's exactly, so people were using, you know, text messages uh, and that sort of thing to get the word out uh, maybe some sort of early versions of Twitter, I don't know, but essentially it was a way that they were able to, um, you know, kind of have what I would call kind of a Lipton soup of, of uh, public protest, uh, you know, pour in boiling water and make it happen. Well, they were doing that in China. What kind of an impact will that have on the regime? Uh, well, it seems to me like, you know, capitalism, um, has become even more robust there. Um, as that happens, there has been an increased exposure to, you know, other places in the world that have civil liberties that Chinese don't have. Um, I think there, the hunger for uh, civil liberties will grow. Um, I think that it's a, it's got it's going to have to be a different strategy. On the other hand, you know, Serbia was not exactly a real, you know. Um, what could I say, a fairy tale kind of country when the Serbians did what they did to overthrow the government. So uh, I think there's a lot to learn from people who have done it and, uh, and then let the Chinese who want to do it develop their own strategy, uh, use the technologies that, that work, uh, and be prepared to be agile in the use of those technologies so you, you stay one step ahead of the government. Great, great summarization there. Thanks. Um, 
So that's, that's about all the time we have, unfortunately, so we're going to have to stop there. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. Joseph, was there anything else you wanted to mention? Um, we didn't get too much time to talk about your book, um, but anything you wanted to mention about that or any sort of uh, closing remarks you wanted to make before we finish up? Well, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm not all that really motivated to sell my book for the sake of the royalties. It's, it's certainly not about that, and, and uh, you know, the royalties are not substantial. Um, I'm, I'm more about wanting people to be able to use it and, and, and put it uh, to good use to prevent violence. And I would say that, um, you know, those who are interested in developing their understandings of of how to prevent violence, how to use technology, uh, how, to, how to use technology to facilitate nonviolent transformation. I think the book would be helpful. Uh, but I also want to stress again that the book that, uh, um, that Chenoweth and um, Stephen wrote uh, that was published by Columbia University Press in 2011 is an excellent book too. So those who are in interested in nonviolent uh, movements and uh, how to be successful, I would read both of the, of the books together. And we'll put that in the, the additional resource links once the recording of, just, of this is posted on our website. So we'll include, I believe uh, Erica had a, Erica Chenoweth had a webinar with us not too long ago. So we'll also put that up and we have a link to the, their book on the website. Um, we'll put up a link to Joseph's book as well. Um, so that's all we have time for today. Um, as I just mentioned, this webinar has been recorded. We'll post it up in the next few days to our website. Um, so if you couldn't attend the whole thing, or if you know somebody who wanted to listen but could not, um, you'll be able to send them that link. And if you had any audio problems, we'll also be balancing the audio. I know sometimes it doesn't come in equal between the two between different speakers. So we'll make sure that this is this is all fixed. Um, you can find this on our website, along with all of our other past and upcoming webinars. If you go to www.nonviolent-conflict.org. And for those of you who are interested, we also had a webinar on a similar topic last week by Mary Joyce, on um, similar to, to actual training and, and crowdsourcing different digital tactics that can be used for a nonviolent struggle. So that's also up on that website um, right now that you can go and take a look. Um, and also, as you see on your screen right there, just a few quick things. Um, any extra questions, go ahead and send them to that email address, webinar at nonviolent-conflict.org. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter. We also just launched, speaking of third generation technologies, we just launched a new iPhone app. Uh, it's free to download. Just either follow that link or search for People Power in the iTunes Store. And that also includes all of our past webinar recordings, all of our resources, conflict summaries, all that. So it's, it's very handy. Um, and also, one, one, one other quick digital initiative we have going on is our uh, e universal e-classroom um, that we've just launched. It's, it's not yet public. But we are offering limited access to people if you're interested in, in reviewing it and checking out the resources. Um, it's a structured online curriculum on civil resistance that is constantly being updated. So there's always going to be more information there for you. And we'd love if you could take a look and give us some feedback. So um, I think that's it for today. Um, Joseph, again, thank you very, very much for your presentation. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks, everyone, and we will be sure to let you know when our next webinar is coming up.